Welcome to April. Everyone has a voice. And as they uh, say, um, it's a lovely day in the neighborhood. We have poetry um, here in the Driscoll Art Gallery. We have the, the, Boston, the Brockton um, Chamber Orchestra downstairs. It's a lovely day. We have uh, Easter and Passover uh, this weekend. So um, it's an amazing time to be in Brockton. Let me uh, just let you know a couple of things that are coming up. Um, May 7th, we will be having the selection of the Youth Poet Laureate. This will be the first Youth Poet Laureate selected for the city of Brockton. And it is now an ordinance that from now on, that the city of Brockton will have a Youth Poet Laureate. Um, that's gonna be May 7th. On April 30th, we have the Educators Showcase where teachers from Brockton High, and Cardinal Spellman, New Heights Charter, Bridgewater State, Massasoit uh, will read their poetry. The teachers and professors will read their poetry. And we have a special guest from Suffolk University, Dr. Fred Marchant who will also be um, presenting his poetry. And in May, we have our features. Um, Anita D. from Brockton will be featuring, and Delora Ahid, also from Brockton. So we're going to have two local poets featuring in uh, Brockton. And that's going to be May 21st. So first of all, many thanks to Paul Engel, the director of the library, for giving us this wonderful space uh, to, to present our poetry and our thoughts and our words. Um, I want to thank, uh, we're going to have a small, intimate open mic today, which is usually uh, pretty impressive. We have uh, two youth who will be presenting and our adults who will pre be presenting. And we have our features. Mr. Stephen Delbois from uh, Plymouth. He is the Poet Laureate from Plymouth. And Avanji Jocks um, from Brockton will be our student feature. So I am going to start off um, with a couple of poems. So this first poem is kind of um, what's going on around us today. Uh, the turmoil, the confusion. Um, this was written when I was um, in Greece visiting my father's birthplace, which was um, his village um, was established in the 13th century. And it's pretty much the same today as it was then. They do have electricity and running water and all that stuff. But the city itself is the same. You drive up to the outskirts of the city, leave your car there, and then you have to walk into the village and walk through the paths and the secret, they have little secret passageways. It's, in, it's incredible. So as I was doing that during the day, I would go home at night and get on my computer and I was back into the 21st century. It was, it was quite a conundrum. So um, I wrote this poem, and this was written, I think, in 2017. Um, and as they say, poetry holds its words. This is called Ancient Ruins. A day is but a moment among ruins. Ever-changing years seem to weave a seamless continuum of unbroken time over ancient, broken sites. Yet why does the earth spin on its axis along the same sunny path? Why does this globe carry all our pieces in a closed loop? Sky blue, 
and sky white mirror the sea, draw us into reflection, seducing us to delve into deep, separate oceans to seek origin. But when do we truly look at each other as specimens of the species human? Are we evolving or are we devolving? Scholars remind us to learn from our past or be condemned to repeat it. What have we learned of science, mathematics, religion, philosophy, and greed? Who gave us supposable thumbs to crush the future? Who gave us tools to create? Oh my God, what have we given rise to? We call ourselves compassionate, humane, and intelligent as nations lay bleeding between fingers too tiny to hold the future. Why do so many hands squeeze out innocence in the name of what deity? Why do we seek sanctuary in time of suffering, seek safe passage, refuge, and haven, but harbor leaders who turn eyes blind or away? Does Mother Earth feel her garden grow barren as her marrow is sucked out, while crimes against humanity regenerates like infectious cancer? We cry out animal at those who do us injustice. We snivel around mouthfuls of burnt fat and guzzled spirits as we dread the cries of the silence that speaks to us. Arms for the poor. Arms for the poor. And just where are we on the evolutionary scale? We wonder at ancient ruins and marvel at what was. I ask you, what do such acts foretell? Will there be anything to wonder of us? I wonder today among the ruins. And uh, the second poem is called Tell Me John, and it kind of goes into the weekend that we're going to be having with Easter and Passover. Uh, sometimes you just question uh, your faith. And this was one of the times I um, questioned my faith. I stood by the river's water where John rested. Waiting to hear the words of wisdom, my soul empties. I cannot see into the future. Last chance for a miracle. Step right up to be submerged and let our sins be washed away. Souvenirs guide the way. The closer we get, the more the cost. What price do we pay for our salvation? Tell me, John, who was saved when all our sins are washed away. Standing at the mountaintop, hands raised above the horizon, my mind in repentance. The sun and moon share the sky, reflections collide, rivers converge into the bedrock, scars reopen, the heart is left beaten. The red dawn of the morning bleeds into tears that replenish the dry ground of sorrow. Come, ride the beast of burden who carries the weight we would never accept. Tell me, John, who is saved when the beast stumbles. Bring him here to the water's edge. Let him rest upon our shoulders. Let him drink from the tears that fall from the shadows of our hearts. Then lay with him by the waters. Let the droplets of forgiveness Baptized, listen to voices resilient, rippling, infinite, rippling, infinite. Last chance for a miracle. Step right up to be submerged. Tell me, John, who is saved when all our sins do not wash away. So we are going to start our open mic, and we have a special open mic. This is the son of our feature, um, Theo, Theo Del Boys. So this is called Smokestack, and 
uh, I made it in one of Dad's readings because I got a lot of time. <laughs> I speak the smokestacks air shadowing into me. People talking all around the world. Those people, uh, those people banned from die. Horror haunting us. But joyful kids are staring into the smokestack, overshadowing it. That's it. Thank you, Theo. Another round for Theo. And I would like to introduce our other youth open mic, uh, Miss Angelique Andre. It's me, it's the usual Angelique Andre, and this time I have two poems. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to be reading the cat creations first. Every day a new cat is born. It could be a Maine Coon or a Tabby. Every day, someone adopts a cat. Not everyone likes cats, though. In the U.S., dogs are more popular, so that's why I want to write about cats. I grew up with cats. In school, everyone is annoyed because all I used to talk about was cats. Only a million kids at school ask why my favorite animal is cats, and my answer is the same every time. Besides, it's obvious. I have two cats, Fuzzy and Smokey. Fuzzy is on the lap, and Smokey's in his bed for it made out of two chairs and a table. I have a cat pen, shirt, bed set, and tablet cover. I also have a lucky cat that I got from Chinatown. I prefer cats over humans because cats are peaceful, but not the kids in my grade. That's just my opinion. It would be nice to spend the school day with my friends and cats. Well, I'm going to go play with Smokey, and this is the last sentence anyways. <coughs> and my second poem is because of COVID-19. Let's start in January 2021. I had a great time celebrating my birthday, but everyone had a mask on because of COVID. February, it was Valentine's Day and I exchanged presents with my parents. We had to stay home because of COVID. April, it was Easter and my cousins did not come because of COVID. May, we celebrated my mom's birthday and my mother's day, but when we went to the restaurant, we had to wear masks because of COVID. June and July 2021, we celebrated Father's Day in July 4th with masks on because of COVID. Ever get tired of writing because of COVID? Because I have. October 2021. I had to go trick-or-treating with a mask on because of COVID. November 2021. I had to celebrate Thanksgiving with a mask on. Okay, now I'm tired and hungry because of writing because of COVID. I had to get my first vaccine because of COVID. I'm sorry, you're probably annoyed now. December 2021. I could finally stop writing because of COVID. Oh, I was wrong. I have my second vaccine scheduled December 3rd because of COVID. Thanks. Okay, adults, you have a lot to live up to. And our youth is in very good hands. Our future is in very good hands with our youth. May I present Mr. Jonathan Stroud. So uh, this poem is just basically a question that we all ask and a uh, question that we all answer at a point. So the title of this poem is, Do You Trust Me? Do you trust me? What a loaded question. Like the scorpion that wanted to cross the river but couldn't swim. It asked a frog to carry it across the river's bend. Why not trust again? It's logical. You can't always hold trust in. Why not trust again? Like the frog considers this argument sensible and agrees to transport the scorpion. Midway across the river and seas, the scorpion stings the frog anyway, dooming the both of them. Trust again. Like grace, trust is a five-letter word that demands a foundation. But unlike grace, it cannot easily be erased. Like the five fingers at the end of my arm, I can count on one hand who I trust in all. The foundation is the lowest load-bearing part of a structure or a building, typically below ground level. Why should I trust again and lean not on my own understanding? My understanding from the beginning was to trust in us over them, but over them, 
over whim, like a game played with no end. Trust should have been the foundational love language over words of affirmation, over quality time, over physical touch, over acts of service, over receiving gifts. Trust should have been over them. But what do I do when asked again, do you trust me? The dying frog asked the same question. He asked the question. He asked the scorpion why it stung, despite knowing the consequence. To which the scorpion replies, I'm sorry, but I couldn't resist the urge to my nature. So why trust them? Why trust again? And we have a first time presenter at Everyone Has a Voice. Will you please, well, oh, I, I see her like it. But it's her turn, so she's got to come up. Linda McDonald. I have a daughter who's attending the University of Rhode Island, and uh, I wrote a poem for her for her 21st birthday. She's rather a fan of Yosemite, so that is the inspiration for this poem named Thread Edged. On the edge of earth, rays strike granite edifices, knowingly wrapping their arms to hold fast the rock. Those monoliths largely impose their thoughts of indifference on warmly beings of stone. In the valley, blowing tresses of grass sirens bendulate in lupine purple waves. Witness wind apparitions rapidly rise, carrying petals to where above the shards broken day plummet. So the dusk, deliberate in denial, dozes. Golden can't stay. It feigns to hold the light that inches through the forest below. Tall trees walk to cast long shadows, and where their branches lean, ingots are melted. There, a sliver remains whose squinting ribbons escape struggling eyes, and so see with vision that is thread-edged to hold the horizon. Ignite the night, the darkness beckons. The burn illuminates the broken stone that is lightning struck, saturated and eroding. River stone cairns meander with appendages and fire sticks waving the trees clacking. I release you. Lit tongues of fire climb the wood consuming it and where the giants are now reborn in seed. These visions keep the distracted ardor in a lamp for later, carried close, illuminating the steps before you. The wildness restores belief in creatures born to climb and hang from crumbling sculptures, daydreaming, yet conceived from asteroid dust. We are determination of design. Our journey long to overcome summits is threadbare worn and isolated on the edge where fanciful walks the precipice, ready to fall, to rise. I have more, but I'll leave room for others. <laughs> You'd like one more? All right, I'll, I'll, bring, I'll bring one more to you. Let's see, I have another poem that, um, this one I wrote for um, an, another niece who's a photographer, and uh, she graduated. I have a lot of nieces. They are all college students, and uh, she graduated from MassArt. So this one was uh, her. She was my inspiration. This one is called Sol Silo. Come what rain, the ocean steel reflects the red silo, undulating ellipses of amaranth and gray, painting the mystery beguiling my camera. I seek beneath for that siren of Mars who must have slipped her throne of madness to the blue calm, creating a ballet dancing in color. My hand reaches through the silvery surface, but the surly red remains untouched by hand or man, a reflection only Alice understands. So please welcome Trish Clinton. I figure just because Easter is tomorrow, it's only fitting to have a poem about Easter. So this is what Easter means to me. Wandering through the wilderness, out into the cold, try to escape from our dark holes. Sorrow beats down, waiting for joy to come around. 
Life's too hard to manage, can't shrug off the facts that life's a mess and we've begun to crack. Stories of old remind me of you, yet deep feelings of pain come out. Can we allow the sun to shine through clouds of doubt? I want to hear your voice, Lord, but the world's loud noises drown you out. This desert heart has fallen apart. The pieces scattered like shrapnel, overflowing carts. Head spinning, thoughts out of control. Finding meaning in this life is a distant goal. Desperate cries and broken praise. Have all the songs been sung? Is there room still for one? One more shattered person claiming that you are good. One more cry to you for mercy. Hungry souls declare, God, you are enough. The shame of all our failures to wear a mask and try to hide, but through it all, he's by our side. He made the ultimate sacrifice, a gift of love, surely changed the world as a sign from the good Lord above. Miracles we see as signs that you're here on earth, you reaching lost souls no matter their statue, their stature, or society's standards of worth. You ask, am I worth it? Would he have done it all just for me? Yes, the torture of his flesh and all the bloodshed, he did it and had no regret. In a broken world where there's so many obstacles and distractions, we only need to take one action. Say, Lord, I am here, a sinner, and I'm feeling all alone. So I come here boldly to your mighty throne. Asking for forgiveness, set me apart, heal the damage I caused to others, but also to my heart. Know that my journey through the shadows were keeping me bound in fear. I now can push aside and face the person in the mirror. For madness is all around me and darkness has been worn on my sleeve. My blind eyes are open and I see myself for who made me to be. I know I'm enough. No lies are too loud, no pit so deep that keeps you from being proud. This is Passion Week. Easter can be a process of healing, to let go of hard things or pain we've been feeling. Love on our fellow man, do it now whenever you can. With God, mercies are new each morning. Jesus' love conquered the grave. There's no question, it's available to us all by laying down our burdens, step into his presence and be brave. Let the spirit of Easter transform your innermost being and become the person God's called you to be. It's spiritual and free. Thank you. And now it's time for our youth, our student uh, poet. Um, his name is Avanji Jocks. He's 15 years old and a sophomore at Avon Middle High School. He also attends colleges, um, classes at Berkeley College of Music. Ivanji has been writing poetry since elementary school and is very fond of it. He has been playing piano for 12 years and is a member of his school's drama club and a powerful actor. Avanji enjoys all forms of poetry, from the standard Orion schemes to haikus. Please welcome Avanji Jocks. Yes, uh, I love to write poetry, and I remember the first time coming to one of these Everyone Has a Voice events, and I really enjoyed it. And then, you know, Philip gave me the opportunity to be one of the student features. So. But um, for today, I have a few poems that I've written at various different points. So um, I'll start off with one that I call, uh, call uh, Free Will. And uh, this is a haiku, but it's not a standard haiku, which is 575, but I decided to extend it, making it 57575. So this is Free Will. And this kind of goes in with the time period and like how we've had so far, so Free Will. Don't you lecture me about free will. There's still war and hate in the world. Is that what we've done with our free will? Pitiful. So that's my free will haiku. 
And then another one that I've written, and this one, you know, this is kind of something that lots of people can relate to, and I title it Slacking Off. So, have you ever had somebody stand in front of the TV while you are watching? You're betting on that soccer player. The prospect of victory makes your brain's cash register go ka -ching. You've prepared your chips next to your salsa bowl. The person stands in front of the TV. The other team scores an upsetting goal. They're oblivious to your excitement for the game. They still don't get the hint. They still won't budge. You start to squint. You attempt to get them to move, but perhaps it should be you. Too bad you're just too lazy to move. And that's my slacking off poem. And then another poem I have is Island of Isolation. And the origin of this is, so this was originally a school assignment that I had. And um, we were reading the book of Mice and Men and um, talking about like, it takes place in the Great Depression and the isolation that different workers have traveling across just to make money for, you know, making off the best they can. And I decided to adapt it. And while I was kind of supposed to be based off the book, it's the theme overall was isolation and loneliness. So I decided to call it Island of Isolation. Cast away to the island of isolation. No life besides you, not even a sea crustacean. Far from society, filling you with sadness, not elation. The worst part of it all, the island is your mental creation. Loneliness, a feeling people had during the COVID quarantine, trapped inside our homes, hoping and praying for a vaccine. With COVID rampant throughout our nation, the future felt unforeseen. If only we could go back with a time machine. Sometimes you can be lonely without being alone. No one seems to notice you as if your existence is unknown. You try to stand up for yourself, but you're afraid they'll react with an annoyed tone. So you sit in silence all by yourselves, just you on your own. Fortunately, these, feeling, these feelings of loneliness can be beaten. Reach out to those who are lonely, treat others the way you want to be treated. A simple hello may be all that is needed. With that kind gesture, their loneliness is defeated. And then finally, um, one of the poems I have, I titled Best Medicine. And if you can guess what the best medicine is, it's laughter. So I decided to write this whole poem about laughter after getting a book that I received about laughter and its benefits, so it's laughter. Best medicine. Laughter is a whole body experience, a brain reaction to something hilarious. Muscles move as our breathing starts to change, exploiting with sound and joy. This is normal, not strange. From there, our brain sips on a laughter cocktail of endorphins and dopamine. It's on a trip to Las Vegas, helping our body run like a well-oiled machine. When we laugh, it is easier to produce a positive thought. It can improve concentration and confidence, increasing our thinking a lot. We become more present in the moment, since laughter can bring immersion. Laughter helped with my poem, making me a more creative person. With laughter comes a brand new perspective, opening your mind to numerous ideas, making you more receptive. So why do we laugh nowadays? It can be out of choice or as a response to a funny phrase. For relief, for enjoyment, it's also fun for me and you. Laughter is the best medicine and it's highly contagious too. Thank you. Okay, I guess I can do a few more poems since you guys seem to enjoy them. Okay, let's see. Okay, one I have is, um, it's called The Phoenix Will Always Rise. And um, this is a golden shovel poem, which basically you take uh, lines from a poem and you 
make them into, you make them the ending of each line in the poem. So uh, this is from a Maya Angelou poem. I forget which one it is, but, um, but I titled this The Phoenix Will Always Rise and it's kind of based off of that. So everyone looked at it, giving it cold shoulders, a bottomless pit within its mind, constantly falling. It spread its wings, it wouldn't be put down. They won't settle for this. That's not what they're like. In the end, there was no shedding of teardrops. And then another poem I have is Piano for Hours and Hours. And obviously, when you heard my bio, um, I've been playing piano for 12 years. So, you know, piano is kind of one of my biggest inspirations when it comes to poetry. And this is one of the poems inspired of it. So, music can make me lose control. I can play piano for hours and hours and hours on a roll. Can't stop, won't stop, here I go. Practice makes perfect, my musical talent will grow. Music is a part of me making me whole. And that's that. And then um, I guess fi another one that I have is, um, so this is titled, We Live in a Society. And this is one that was an assignment that I had when I was in middle school. And um, it was like, just make a poem it has to be at least four stanzas and has to have a rhyme scheme. And you know, even though I enjoy rhyme schemes, you know, it's kind of weird being limited to only rhyme schemes. But um, I decided to, you know, adhere to the, assignment. So this is, we live in a society. We live in a society where we have to worry about school shootings. Innocent people are dying. It's not fair. Families are left in mourning, missing their wings. We live in a society where countries are in strife. It is horrible. War can happen any day. Countries won't share. The politicians do not care for their people. We live in a society where children wake up cold, alone, and hungry. They hope for a new life, but people don't care. With no future, everyone sees them as ugly. Let us make, us, let us make our society a friendly environment for everyone, a cooperative place where people can stay home where everybody is together as one. And yeah, so those are all of my poems that I have, so thank you. Thank you, Avanji. As I said earlier, our future is in good voice. So let us thank Theo, Angelique, and Avanji. So now I'd like to introduce our feature poet, Stephen Delbois, the first poet laureate of Plymouth, Mass. He is an author of In Memory of Fire, Light Leading, Light Reading, I'm sorry, Light Reading and Small Talk. Awarded the Penham Translation Grant in 2015, he has translated widely from Czech, including Taraz's Riedelbacher, Paris Notebook, visible spec, uh, from, by Visible Spectrum in 2021, and Vitzislav Nezval. Nezval, Woman in the Plural. His scholarly works include The New American Poetry and Cold War Nationalism. He is co-founder of the web journal Body, B-O-D-Y. Please welcome Stephen Delpa. Theo and I have been on the road quite a bit this last week. Uh, we had a couple workshops and things at high schools in Plymouth. Um, we had a reading and a talk up in New Hampshire, a reading down in Plymouth. And um, so, you know, getting a lot of exposure at different kind of scenes and, um, you know, different reading events and atmospheres in, uh, in the last week. And, you really, it's pretty amazing. You walk into a place and you can kind of feel the vibe and feel the atmosphere immediately. And walking in here today, downstairs, it's the first time I've been to the 
the Brockton Library, but you know, serenaded with classical music as you walk in and the incredible um, paintings and, and then just to hear the amazing poetry and, and see all of you, it's, it's a tribute to the town and a, a tribute to the work that Philip has done as Poet Laureate. So I'm really just thrilled to be here today to be able to read uh, some poems for you. So it is National Poetry Month and um, I always feel a little bit ambivalent about National Poetry Month, to be honest, because for a, a lot of people, it's like, you know, suddenly in the month of April, poetry is everywhere. You're seeing it on social media, you know, in regular media. And then once May comes around, it kind of seems to disappear, you know. And I, I think if you're involved in poetry and um, especially on the official side as a laureate, it, uh, poetry is really more of an everyday thing and every Every day is Poetry Day and every month is Poetry Month. So, you know, I always feel like um, Poetry Month shouldn't end when April ends. And, um, you know, as much as I love the positive side of poetry, the brightness and the way that poetry can uh, kind of train our eyes to find beauty in unlikely places, I'm also interested in the kind of darker black magic side of poetry. Um, you know, the way that poetry can also be a kind of a spell in a way, and so I wrote this first poem with that in mind. It's called Poem for Students, and um, it's a sonnet. It uses underwater imagery and marine imagery, maritime Im imagery, which I use in my work very often um, growing up on the water in Plymouth. And it's a little bit um, trying to be encouraging for students, but also opening up to that uh, little bit of the black magic because we all know the beautiful side so well. Poem for students. Words are underwater caves, hold your breath. Diving, risk asphyxiation. All thoughts flounder in desolate light. Nervous fish, flitting shiners, form schools, elusive. This is to say, fillet syllables. Heard of the vampire octopus? Strange beasts roam the melted sea floor where blood cannot bloom. Each line is a broken lung, a dark balloon, and craters swallow anchors. Never trust a snorkeler. Be very careful. Words are not completely fathomable. Furthermore, ignore poets on the shore who claim to clutch pearls. You might die poor and blind down there. Might not explicate that. Um, the next poem I'd like to read is a poem in form. Uh, I don't often write in rhyme and meter, although I'll read a couple poems in rhyme and meter. Um, but this is a great example of a poem that, uh, where the rhyme and meter really worked out well. Often when I sit down to write a poem in rhyme, I'm thinking, and your, your poetry was so musical and rhyming and you can hear that musical influence. Often I sit down to write in rhyme and I, I just can't forget, okay, I've got to think of something, you know, I can't escape the rhyme and it becomes very labored and, um, you know, not very spontaneous. But this is a poem where the, the, the form really suggested itself um, and it, it kind of wrote itself in a way. And this is a poem, uh, an example of, I think, a specific power of poetry that differentiates it from other forms of discourse. Uh, and it's what John Keats called negative capability, which is the uh, ability to hold in your mind two opposite ideas at the same time without um, trying to conclude which one is correct. And I think poems often, especially poems that are dealing with public events or difficult events, uh, you know, can kind of consider both sides, the good and the bad, without, you know, going in for either side. And that's what this poem is doing. It's called Gaza Beach. Um, and it starts with an epigraph from CNN.com from July 17th, 2014. And the headline is, Four Boys Killed as They Played on Gaza Beach. Uh, and it ends with a quote from TheIntercept.com, August 12th, 2018. And that headline is, Secret 
Israeli military report reveals drone killed four boys on Gaza Beach in 2014. This is called Gaza Beach. Here are the hiders waiting to seek. Here are four boys dead less than a week. Here is a language they no longer speak here on the beach in Gaza. Here is a world always hungry for more, land and money and war, war, war. Here the television tide floods shore here on the beach in Gaza. Here the sand grains vaporize. Here are the children's missing eyes. Burnt hair floats on a century's lies here on the beach in Gaza. Here is this season's bleeding game, sponsored by men who have no shame. Here is murder by another name here on the beach in Gaza. And um, speaking of children, the, uh, the centerpiece of this book, Small Talk, which came out last year with Dos Madres Press, is a long poem called The Child's Guide to Candor. Uh, and it's dedicated to my son, Theo. And um, I wrote it beginning when he was born. Basically, it was almost like a kind of journaling activity project uh, for the first few years of his life. And uh, those of you who have children know they're the really good alarm clocks, right? So um, suddenly you're kind of doing without sleep in a way that never seemed reasonable or possible before. Um, so I was just, you know, waking up with him super early all the time and um, just started kind of writing, uh, writing lines as I was giving him his, uh, his formula in the morning or whatever it was. And over time it kind of coalesced into a poem and I, I worked on it for quite a long time and cut it down. But um, it's a poem in three parts. Uh, as I said, it's called The Child's Guide to Candor. It has a lot to do with the process of... Uh, raising a child as they come into language and thinking about the way that as a parent you kind of give your child their vocabulary and you influence you know the words that they know and the words that they use and therefore the way that they um, interact with the world this book small talk is a, a lot about communication and the way that you know language and poetry helps us to communicate and really to um, make sense of the world so I'll read just a few uh, passages from this. What is family? Blood architecture, seasons of mind, rooms and furniture, bottles of worries, charted words, bookshelves of names, living photographs, lost property, a story written of flesh and forgiveness, Spirit stays, devotions, topaz tinderbox, the common touch to keep the faith. Fog blanches the harbor, immemorial moans of horns guide sailors to safe passage, and channel markers boundary the deep. I saw a body falling irrevocably, terrible in its plummeting, Stillness, a man shocked to find himself so far above ground. I don't know if he died then or years later, but that sight, his silhouette against air, uncanny as the spirit in flesh. I am trying to tell you everything I still do not know. What I know is easy for you to learn alone. A jellyfish has achieved immortality. Reconstruction of its simple structure falls to sea bottom, sleeps, and reforms cell by cell. I watch my parents feed my son. Life uses us as hourglasses, genes that create, dominate, just passing through. Amen to 3 a.m. shrieks. Amen to my failing teeth. There is a stubborn joy animates my thought. Amen to jellyfish that will outlive us. In this century of tattered American flags, we are numb to the wonders of the planet that sustains us. 
dumb in our solipsistic solace. The great whales go on, pounding headlong through dark, hearts large enough to hold a station wagon. And in the cryptic, post-apocalyptic light of American morning, when noon is a rumor, I redefine momentarily my identity as father. Snow glitters suburbs, a world all albino. I am stung with insomnia, tongue bruised from late wine, and an, and an empty school bus of seen yellow creeps through these streets named for felled trees. My youth is a boy chewing gum in a blank parking lot, locked ice skating rink, 10, 15 p.m. Something tells me I am still there. I am standing stiller than this dawn, awaiting a ride from one car out of millions that's familiar. When I asked my father's advice, he more or less said nothing matters. Don't open your gunny sack of blame. My mother said never write words you don't want read. Don't buy full price except for gifts or drink beer at office parties. They'll take you for a tippler. I say get hurt and hurt few as you can. Learn to fall and get up always. I say stubborn joy. I say rain through midnight lilies. I say forbidden lips. I say a rod of air fastens your forehead to death. Destiny sends birth. I say never bored or lonely. I say rooftop adventure and you can die up there. I say, say everything. I say, listen, you are not the center of anything. The world is all happening beyond your body. Some things you must discover alone like watermelon and white wine. The sucker of spring nights when all's possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that, that poem um, mentions rooftops, um, rooftop adventure. And this poem is about rooftop adventure. And it starts with the word castaway, which one of your poems started with. Great verb, castaway, or noun, could be a noun. Um, in this case, actually, it's an adjective. This poem is called The Rusted Door. Um, and it's about, well, it's about being at a party and climbing on a roof and looking at the roof next door and there was a rusted door. And somehow I thought that this was uh, an omen and I needed to go find what was behind the rusted door. But uh, more generally, the poem is about um, imagination and the way that we are gifted with these kind of moments where we, you know, moments of inspiration or moments of imagination where we kind of, it feels like we're seeing through reality to the real reality behind um, the everyday world. And uh, those moments of inspiration often become um, poems, but often, as often, they just kind of disappear when uh, the sun comes out again. This is called The Rusted Door. Cast away at a laughter party, I climbed the fire, escape to the glittering hull of night sky docked on city rooftops. Sunlight seeped the seam of air and earth. A rusted door on the neighbor roof disrupted dawn. Perhaps I was some cheap champagne Prometheus that unhinged hour, but the rusted door called out like fire. Spidering across the steep roof, I reached the guttered edge paused at the long drop off to concrete. What malicious blessed dreamer pries us from our common sleep to see the secret radiance of the ordinary, then sets us groping again among rough stones. I turn back saying, it's a rusted door shuffled to the dying party. Now every morning if I wake 
in time to watch the ancient sun flood night's floating city, I feel that door's dull burn bolted like a secret in my brain. Thank you. You're very kind. You've got such a kind audience here. Um, mindful for time, I'd like to read this poem, uh, which is a poem that I wrote for uh, the, the Plymouth Poet Laureateship. So as Philip mentioned, I was lucky enough to be named the first Poet Laureate of Plymouth in March of 2020. And so in February of 2020, we had a reading with uh, a bunch of great, talented local poets at the Plymouth Public Library. And um, we were to write some poems for Plymouth, at least one poem for Plymouth. And 2020 was the 400th anniversary uh, of the founding of Plymouth, 1620, 2020. And um, so, you know, too much to write about, too many possible poems, 400 years of history, where to even begin? Uh, it was a real struggle to try to, you know, yeah, come up with something, wrap my head around this topic. I love poems that take a complicated subject and bring it down to something very particular. Uh, the great jazz bass player Charles Mingus uh, said that to make, the, uh, to make the simple complicated is commonplace, but to make the complicated simple, awesomely simple, that's creativity. And uh, I think poets are always trying to take these big things and to try to kind of like filter them through something very specific. So I was searching for a metaphor for 400 years of history and culture and life in Plymouth. And um, I eventually settled on Plymouth Cordage. So in Plymouth, the Plymouth Cordage Company uh, was a rope making factory that was the major employer in town for uh, for more than a hundred years into the 1960s. And um, in its heyday, it was famous around the world as uh, one of the greatest makers of quality rope for, for ships. Um, and so you had ships coming in from around the world bringing uh, materials from Manila, and, you know, the Far East, coming in to Plymouth, uh, docking, lo unloading the raw material, the raw, raw materials woven into rope, and then that rope is shipped around the world, uh, and the rope is then used in ships in all seven seas. And I was really just taken by this idea of, you know, raw material coming into Plymouth and then being woven together into rope that's used around the world. And actually, the more research I did, the more appropriate for poetry it became because one of the great uh, products of the Plymouth Cordage Company was something that they called heart rope and it had a lubricated, uh, the center of the rope was lubricated. So the heart of the rope was lubricated which made it stronger and more flexible. And um, yeah, so all of that is going into this poem and just thinking of this idea of, you know, how it would be possible to make a rope that you then kind of carried around the world. And uh, recently I've been doing some research on the Atlantic Cable the Atlantic Telegraph wire, which was literally a wire from England to uh, kind of the upper Canada, Newfoundland, uh, but a, a wire, physical wire that they basically had two boats come and meet in the middle of the Atlantic and they gave one half of the wire to one boat and then the two boats, one sailed to the east coast of the US, one sailed to Europe and they had this wire, you know, connecting. So. This idea of a, a physical rope that could connect all of the world, I find uh, just really inspiring. Um, and so the poem is called Poem for Plymouth Cordage. And it starts with a quote from the Reverend Peter J. Gomes, who was a, uh, he taught at Harvard Divinity School, but he was from Plymouth and lived in Plymouth. And the quote is, first we shape our story and then our story shapes us. This is poem for Plymouth Cordage. Help weave this heart rope, this cordage of wordage, woven memories, imagination, image and nation, individuals' dreams, 400 years, 12,614,400,000 seconds, 
We weave the cordage of wordage, a rope across horizon gathering every moment we find and write and tell the stories. We take the rope in dinghies and set off toward Europe. Others stay in Plymouth, weaving the rope we carry back eastward around the world, the words, the wars, the bombs, the tragedies and joys, the people, the love, the syllables make lifelines that keep us from drifting into the empty whirlpool of what's forgotten. A story, shivering pilgrims, all aboard over a month, 13 years from home, one birth, one death at sea, desperation their daily ration, water, 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 waves, then Cape Cod cupped hand, a continent still big enough for everyone, for now an etching in black and white, ink and paper, the contrast colors of their pauper clothes. When white men first came ashore, and Wampanoag braves watched from shadowy pine patches, there was a mirror between them. Each saw the limits of their imagination reflected in the other. Protestants and the people of dawn, a mirror between them, no attack could shatter, only understanding to clarify. For 400 years, we must still try to clarify. We must find and learn and tell the stories. A story, we stand knee deep on Brown's bank and stare into the gaping jaws of autumn. That summer fog swallowed the fireworks. That winter they dredged and dredged the harbor depths. We sledded Burial Hill. Stories woven into history, we shape and are shaped by our location. Plymouth, pliant mouth, always telling stories. The lips of language kiss the limits of recollection. Pumpkin comes from papacoon, meaning grows forth round. Wampanoag words, Massachusetts, place of the foothill. Plymouth from Plymouth, England, meaning mouth of the river Plym. A story, I was born on a coast's crooked shoulder where gauze white waves sling shore and sand dunes frame dreams where fishermen with missing thumbs used to huddle in fragrant fog from coffee mugs and briar pipes. Night floats the diving bell moon above a wooden flower docked in the harbor. Just now, I am lying down to find sleep, reading the braille of stars over Plymouth. Who doesn't want the night sometimes to last forever, so dawn's thumb never swipes sky's screen? Who doesn't want to become the place where they are from? And so these words are stories, strands in the cordage we are weaving. We learn everything we can and share it. We are gathering and carrying this rope around the world. We set out eastwards from Plymouth MA to UK, zigzag across all continents, collecting stories and sending them back to be woven, to keep us together and everyone helps as we carry the rope under the Golden Gate, over the Rockies, across Ohio, and here we are at Old Exit 6, coming back into town to tie the knot where everything started, where this community is still telling its story. So where should we tie the knot? Where is the heart of your Plymouth? Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to read just two uh, very new poems to finish. Uh, this first one's called Lobstering, um, or maybe it's called Pulling Traps. It's uh, still fresh, so I'm not sure yet. Um, but it's about pulling traps, lobstering. Lobsters are good and uh, hard work to get if you're getting them yourself. Uh, my cousin has some lobster traps in Plymouth Bay, and so this poem's for him, dedicated to Brian Belcito. Lobstering slash pulling traps. 30 traps take four hours.
for two grown men to pull up, clear, and bait. Thirty years takes thirty years. We pull and pull, curious, hopeful, optimistic even, happy in, wind for a while, happy out here on the water. And the last poem I'd like to read uh, comes from the laureate ship. One of the things I did in 2020, um, which I enjoyed a lot, was getting in touch with the poet laureate of Plymouth, England, uh, whose name was Tom Bolton. And obviously 1620, 2020, Plymouth, England, you know, Plymouth Mass, it, it kind of just invites some kind of uh, collaboration. So over the year of 2020, we went back and forth writing poems to each other, kind of letters back and forth over the Atlantic, again, thinking of the Atlantic uh, telegraph cable. And originally it was uh, meant to be kind of meditating on the two Plymouths and uh, the, the 400th anniversary, but poetry always uh, goes off on a tangent. And uh, very soon the project kind of just went off into territory that I don't think either of us had, you know, could have uh, predicted in advance because he would write something and I would respond and then he would respond to me responding to him. And, you know, it became a kind of four-dimensional chess game um, and we were both trying to, you know, make each other laugh and trick each other and so forth. So he wrote this poem about soup um, and uh, I happen to love soup. You know, who doesn't like soup? It's a good thing. And um, so I started to write in response to his poem about soup. This poem is 19, uh, November 18th, 2020. And it starts with the epigraph from Tom Bolton, poet laureate of Plymouth, England. And the quote is, I must eat more soup. And um, I just got thinking about soup. I really do love soup. Not more than the, the average person, but you know, who doesn't like a good soup, right? I mean, come on, wholesome, you know, it's good. But anyways, I started to think about soup and poetry and, you know, is there any poetry in soup? It's so, such a humble kind of thing. And I uh, started to find all this crazy stuff. You know, Allen Ginsberg and his poem Howl, there's stuff about soup all over the place. I found some Sylvia Plath old soup recipes from this book of Sylvia Plath recipes. Uh, there's a story about soup being really important in early Plymouth. I won't uh, summarize the whole poem, but... You always know you have a good idea when everywhere you look, you're like finding more and more kind of information. So um, yeah, this is a poem for Tom Bolton, November 18th, 2020, quote, I must eat more soup. I contemplate the poetry of soup. Allen Ginsberg wrote in Howell about a certain ghostly days of Chinatown soup alleyways remembered crawling lonesome through Houston seeking jazz or sex or soup and lamented our endless swim in the total animal soup of time. Sylvia Plath used to bake a wicked tomato soup cake. Surely she used Campbell's, maybe showed her kids the Soup Kids cartoons created by Grace G. Drayton whose Dolly Dingle paper dolls illustrated an edition of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's The Courtship of Miles Standish, one of the first great Plymouth poems. In 1623, the pilgrim Edward Winslow visited the dying Sachem Massasoit, scraped gray fur from his tongue with a blade, then fed him strong chicken broth he'd made that soup kept Massasoit alive, preserving uneasy peace in early Massachusetts. I want to make a soup of my existence, toss body, word, and deed into the common pot of public thought, or better yet, a, couple, a copper kettle to decoct the hectic pieces of this life into a truly bracing brew, I offer it to you. <laughs> Thank you. So, we had an intimate day. 
Thank you to Stephen and Yvonne people on the open mic. Um, we will be here next month, May 21st, with our uh, Brockton features. And uh, April 30th, our Educator Showcase. May 7th, we will be selecting our first Youth Poet Laureate. Um, let us not forget, none of this can happen without our director of the library, Mr. Paul Engel. <laughs> so thank you for coming. Have a great Easter, Passover. Um, take in the moment, and we will see you next month. All right, so my name is Angela Andrade, and I am going to be interviewing our feature poet, Abanji. Um, so I'll start off with the first question. When did you first realize you wanted to be a writer? Um, so for me, I think that, um, well, I've always liked to write, but I think um, really, I think my first ever big writing thing was probably when I was 10, and um, I just decided, oh, I want to write. And it wasn't really poetry related, but I decided to write to the Brockton Enterprise an article about um, the kids' view on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And that was kind of really like the biggest uh, writing moment. And then like from there on, I decided to like write more and more and like, you know, different school assignments. And then from school assignments, I had like, you know, a bunch of other opportunities come for writing. So I think that's really what it was. Uh, second question, what does your family think of you writing? Um, I, they really enjoy it. I know that both of my parents have been like really supportive and like backing me up when it comes to my different poems and like, you know, other relatives. Like um, recently I went to Florida for family stuff and um, and then I read, and there um, I read some of my uh, poetry and they like really enjoyed it. They're like really excited. So I know definitely that like all my family really supports my poetry and writing. What are the most surprising things you learned from writing your poetry? Hmm, most surprising things I've heard me. Um, I think really it's just um, how kind of freeing it can be to write poetry. Like, you know, it's just, you know, as they say, anything can be an escape. And, you know, as a musician, they say music is an escape, and that's an escape for me. And then after music, comes like poetry and like you know the two kind of go hand in hand so really it's like um kind of a medium to express yourself are you on social media how does that affect your writing um social media definitely affects um or not really like big but um when it comes to like major news like um especially with the war that's happening and covid and bunch of those inspired my um, poems that I've written, like, um, like free will, and we live in a society, and so on and so forth. So really, I think social media kind of helps keep me informed on like the events, and that can kind of be inspiring for different um, poems that I write. And the very last question, if you could pass along on one piece of advice for young writers, what would it be? Um, I guess really to never stop writing. Like once you start, you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, as I said in one of my poems, can't stop, won't stop, here I go. So, you know, once you start kind of allows you to keep going on and on and on. And kind of when you continue to write, that's when you can kind of get like the kind of true meaning of what you write. So I think that's the one piece of advice I'd pass along. Hi, uh, my name is John Gershroud, and I'm going to be interviewing Stephen today, our, our future poet. So, uh, Stephen, what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Yeah, so when I was about five or six years old, I was on the playground uh, across the street from my house in Plymouth, and for some reason, I got the idea that I would whisper something into my friend's ear, a word that I'd never used before. Um, and the, the word rhymes with grass knoll. 
And for some reason, I just decided to whisper this into his ear. I have no idea why. And I whispered it into his ear and he started to scream and he ran out of the park, across the street, rang on my doorbell and told my mother what I had said to him. And uh, I thought, wow, I did not expect that kind of reaction. And, and that, to be honest, as funny as it sounds, that was the first time when I realized, wow, you know, words can really have an effect on people and it, they can cause things to happen that you don't always intend. So uh, how long did it actually take you to start sharing your poetry? Um, it took a while. I, I was really lucky. I had a friend of mine who would come to Plymouth in the summertime. Uh, his, I think his dad and his stepmom lived across the street. He was from Maine, but he would come in the summer and spend the summers in Plymouth. And we, when I was maybe 10, 11, 12 area, um, we, you know, again, like, I don't know why exactly, but we just decided we were going to be starting to write poetry together. So he got a notebook, I got a notebook, and we would write things and kind of compare notes and see, you know, what each other, you know, was doing. And that was really the first time I started to share things. And um, I was always really lucky in school. I, I had really inspiring teachers. And, uh, you know, through college and university and, and now even into adult life, mentors and people who encouraged me to share and, you know, kind of took away a little bit of that nervousness that you feel when you're sharing your, your work, you know, early on anyways. So um, I got really lucky in that way of, of having that kind of receptive community. Uh, but it took me a while to start really sending things out, you know, for to submit to journals and things like that. That was really, wasn't until I was kind of in college or so. Um, but even now, when I write something, I put it in the drawer or have it on my computer and I don't really do much with it for a long, long time. It's normal that I don't, if I write something new, I often don't even look at it myself for another year or until more time has passed and certainly I don't, share it with, uh, you know, send it out or really share it with people it, for a long time, sometimes years and years. Um, readings like this are a great opportunity to kind of test new work and you like take the temperature on a poem. But um, yeah, I, I think it's important to strike a balance of getting your work out there, but also not feeling too much pressure to like put a lot of, you know, put a lot out there because the longer you can take with a poem, the more you can keep it a secret, you know, keep it steeping. I think the better it's going to be in the end. So how do you think you've evolved as a writer over the years? Uh, I'd like to think I've evolved as a writer and as a person, you know, and hopefully the evolution of my writing has come alongside my evolution as a person. Uh, I think when you, we all have a certain idea, you know, of what makes a poem. I like this idea of the poetic occasion, you know, which is like, what is something that makes you want to write a poem? You know, and it, so often it's a, a big emotional event or, a, you know, just a, a breakup or a loss or, you know, or a soup, you know, like the soup poem I read today. Uh, I think as you grow up and you, uh, your relationship with poetry evolves, you, one of the things that evolves is your sense of the poetic occasion and um, kind of realizing that not every poem has to be, you know, a heartbreak or the end of the world kind of emotionally. And you can find poetry in, in, in everyday things. And often poems that are about things that seem unpoetic can be most interesting because they're kind of unexpected, you know. But I think also your as time goes on, your relationship to the language changes and you learn, you know, you learn new words and you read new things and you come under new influences. I can remember, you know, in my twenties wanting every single line to be very hard and using a lot of alliteration, a lot of music and wanting everything to be like super, super pressured, like, you know, lots of pressure on the language. And now, yeah, as time goes on, I, I feel less, pressure to pressurize the language and I'm more interested in kind of finding 
um, poetry in everyday events and using everyday language to try to elevate it into poetry. So tell us some of the influences that inspire you as an individual. Yeah, um, soup is a big one. I like soup. Um, soup is inspiring. Good food is inspiring. Anyone who um, does something with care, you know, and so like someone makes you a great soup or makes a great meal or, you know, being in a place like the, the library here today and just getting the, the vibe from the staff and the whole atmosphere of people who really care about, you know, what they're doing and, and just the reading today, like, um, yeah, being in touch with people who, who care about what they're doing. And that could be a, you know, factory worker on an assembly line, or it could be a, you know, visual artist. Um, there's a great, so I read a lot. I like compulsively read. And as you can see, I'm passing that on to my son. Um, you know, reading is a way to stay in touch with the language, with the imagination. And um, there's a quote, a funny quote from the poet W.H. Auden, who says something like, uh, poets after 30 are bound to be voracious readers. But they probably read very little poetry. Uh, and so I'm always like reading, you know, I like to read about art and about history and about just any, anything, you know, I don't know, maritime stuff. And I like the history of the Cold War. I read tons of biographies about artists and, you know, other like interesting figures just to figure out how people kind of did it. How do you have a life that is creative and also, you know, can allow you to provide for yourself and, and others. Um, Massachusetts, like the landscape, the ocean, the, the mix of cities and, and ocean and forest, the light in Massachusetts, which is very, very specific, is always inspiring, um, you know, travel, jet lag. I've been thinking about jet lag as time travel lately um, and kind of moving through the world in that unhinged kind of way. You know, as I was saying during the reading, like when you're working on a project and everything that you see seems to be something that you could use in the project, you know you've kind of hooked into something good. And um, there's a great writer, Walter Patter, who wrote about uh, the object of life was for creative people is to keep burning with a hard gem-like flame, he said. And I think, you know, anyone who's involved in anything creative, you know that feeling. Some people call it the flow when you, you just get into something and you're like just, and people feel like playing a video game or watching a movie or a sports game. It can happen anywhere, but like you just get into the zone and I'm trying to like get into the zone all the time, you know, and the more I can be in that zone, whether it's feeling inspired, looking at a painting or hearing a poem or, or writing something, or, you know, driving down the highway and just being awake to the gorgeousness of life. Um, yeah, it's a, it's like almost a, a discipline to try to stay inspired all the time, you know, and that's something that trying to stay inspired keeps me inspired. You know what I mean? Yes. So throughout the time, there's been an evolution of social media. So how has this platform affected your writing process? And would you say that that is for the better or is it a determinant? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think something that, you know, everyone's thinking about these days, uh, whether they know it or not. I, so I'm active on social media. Um, you know, it's given me a great platform for the laureateship in Plymouth just to get get the word out there about events and, um, and, and, and also, you know, hosting live events on Facebook and publishing videos of people reading. There are so many things that social media allows us to do that, you know, weren't possible uh, even 10, 15 years ago. Uh, I can, you know, I'm, I was born in 82. I'm probably, my generation's like one of the last where it was in high school that the internet started to just, you know, come around and uh, we had a computer lab and you could go and get on the internet. It would take you a half an hour for the thing to dial up and be making all these crazy noises. And you didn't even really know like what the point of the internet was because it was so slow and so limited. Um, and to see that shift where, you know, I'm on the internet all the time, 
he's on the internet all the time. Everyone is connected all the time. I think it's there. There's a negative side of it where if you don't know what it's like to walk through a field without your phone and to be like completely in the moment and not worrying, I need to take a photo so I can post this or I need to live stream this. Like if you haven't had that experience of being in the world in a moment, you know, um, where you're disconnected from the internet, but totally connected to the planet, I think, you know, you're, that's a, a shame. Um, but you can't blame anyone for, because we're just living in the, in the internet age. But um, anyways, you know, specifically with writing poetry, I love to write poems on Twitter and to think about just trying to write really, 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 really short stuff. Um, and like, how do you, you know, can I post one word or two words that's going to somehow translate and have an effect, you know? So there's lots of interesting stuff out there with poetry, you know, digital poetry, poetry that uses social media or some of the digital tools that we have. And I think that's going to become more interesting as like just people start to use those tools in a more organic way in their writing and in their art. Uh, so, you know, like anything else, I mean, when, so I think I was just reading something, you know, in the 1950s, like I think in like 1954, one out of every 500 homes in America had a television. And then four years later, just about every single home had a television. So in the 50s, you know, there was this huge explosion of televisions and uh, in popularity. And, uh, you know, of course, there were lots of people saying that television was going to be the end of civilization. And uh, I'm sure it destroyed a few things. It created lots of other things. And so I think, you know, social media, just like anything else, it's, uh, it's a tool. And if you are using it without being conscious, you know, then it can have det detrimental effects. But I think for poets to network and the decentralization of publication, the way that you can create your own network, you can create your own website, poetry website. You don't need to send stuff away to some hundred year old poetry magazine. You can create your own magazine and you can start your own scene here in Brockton or down in Plymouth. And I think the greatest thing of the internet is that is that decentralization that we're no longer uh, so reliant on the hierarchies of, of power and authority, you know, in poetry and publishing and in media in general. So I think, uh, you know, the really interesting poets of the mid to late 21st century are going to be utilizing uh, social media in a way that uh, empowers them, empowers the art and the craft of poetry and brings it to, you know, to heights that we can't even imagine yet. So if you could pass along your advice for poets or anyone considering the artists, what would it be? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, any creative pursuit, um, you know, essentially everything in life is uh, in, the, in, the, in the place that we live and the way that life is set up. Everything is conspiring against you. Um, so in order to be creative, in order to write a poem, in order to paint a picture, compose some music on the piano, you are in a personal space where you are not, uh, you're like invincible from all other corporate and other powers that are trying to take your attention and your time and your money. I think creative pursuits uh, are, you know, they create this kind of invincible space. And again, that idea of the flow, like when you're in the moment, when you're in the zone, whether it's creating something or in admiration, you know, listening to a great composition or, or, or seeing a play or going to a poetry reading, <clears throat> you're in a space that is, uh, yeah, kind of, you're in a force field of, of, of creative power. And um, entering into that, putting yourself in that space as often as possible, going to poetry readings, reading as much as you can, listening to as much music as you can, looking at art, um, exposing yourself to things that you don't like on the first read or the first listen or the first look. I think that's some of the best um, advice that I ever got. It's like, you know, the music that confuses you the first time you hear it, that's what you need to listen to harder because that's pushing the boundaries, you know? 
And so if you're only ever exposing yourself to things that you love on the first sight, then you're not ever pushing your, your boundaries. I think the more you can push your boundaries, you know, as fast as you can do it, the better. But I think in general, I would say that anyone involved in any creative pursuit, you've got to take yourself very seriously in order to, you know, to write a poem, to write a song, to make a painting. You've got to really like think you have something to offer, something to say, or something that's worthwhile. So if you're going to do it at all, you need to kind of have that confidence. But at the same time, I think it's crucial to remember that in the great scheme of things, if you don't write this sonnet, if you don't finish this picture, um, there aren't going to be any adverse effects in the, in the wide world. If you do finish the picture and show it to somebody, you might change their life, you know, or your poem could change somebody's life. But if you don't finish it, you know, nobody's going to die. Um, so I think having that, being able to strike the balance of taking yourself super seriously and not taking yourself seriously at all, if you can manage that, then, you know, nothing will uh, harm you. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you.